Now that we know how to represent all the input bundles that can produce a certain level of output in an isoquant, we can return back to the two-step profit maximization method, except now we can apply it to the case of two inputs. Remember, the first step in that method was to ask the question, how much is it going to cost to produce different levels of the output? How much is it going to cost, for example, to produce this level of the output? Now imagine that I was the owner of a firm and you were a manager, and I gave you a budget and I asked you to produce this quantity of X with that budget. Now we know from our consumer theory how to graph budgets. They're simply lines with the slope equal to the ratio of prices. When we had x1 on this axis and x2 on this axis, the slope of the budget line was minus p1 over p2. Now that I'm asking you to buy labor and capital, the slope of that budget line is going to be minus the wage divided by the rental rate. So we know that budgets are going to have a slope of minus w over r. Now where the budget falls depends on how much money I give you. So suppose I gave you a budget that results in this budget line. Now that budget is going to have this slope, minus w over r, the price of the input on the horizontal axis divided by the price of the input on the vertical axis. But here I've given you too much money. You can certainly produce x with this budget, but you could also do it with less money. So you'd come back to me and say, well, you've given me too much money. I can do it with less. Well, how much do I have to give you? Well, we can imagine taking this budget and shifting it in. It will shift it in parallel because we're keeping the wage and the rental rate the same. And we'll keep shifting it in until we get a tangency with the isoquant, until we get to a point like this. We've then found the smallest possible budget that will allow you to produce that level of the output. And you'll do it with this much labor and this much capital. So which input bundle you're going to pick to produce X will depend on how expensive labor is relative to capital, what the slope of this budget line is. These budget lines for producers are often called ISO costs, but they're just budget lines. Now that we have the least cost input bundle to produce this level of output, we have the first point for our cost function, a function that will tell us how much it costs to produce different quantities of x given the wage and the rental rate. So in our picture, we're going to hold these fixed. And we're going to just trace out how much it's going to cost to produce different quantities of the output. So we'll have output on the horizontal axis. We can put dollars on the vertical axis. And for this initial green level of x, suppose it was here, we can now say that the cost of producing that is going to be the wage times how much labor I hire times the rental rate times plus the rental rate times how much capital I'm going to hire. So all we have to do is multiply the amount of labor we've chosen by the wage, the amount of capital we've chosen by the rental rate, and add those up, and that'll give us the cost of producing that much output, the least cost possible. Well, if we can do that for one level of output, we could do it for every level of output. Every level of output has an isoquant, and we can find that tangency for every isoquant and trace out what this cost function will look like. But because we're assuming that our production process is homothetic, we know where all those tangencies are going to lie. If we keep the slope of the budgets constant, as we would because the wage and rental rate don't change, we would simply end up on a ray from the origin. And we would know that we'd have another tangency on the magenta budget. So there'd be another tangency here that would be associated with some other level of output x prime. So the least cost way of producing that level of output will be to hire this much labor, L prime, this much capital, K prime, and the cost would just be equal to the wage times L prime plus the rental rate times K prime. 
So for the output level x prime, we'd get another point on the cost function. And by doing that for every isoquant, with all the tangencies lying on this ray, we can trace out what that cost function will look like. Now, we're operating on this ray from the origin, which means in this picture we're operating on a ray from the origin. And you can see that with this production function, as we go along that ray which lies in the plane, we'll have a production function, a slice of the production function, that initially has a slope that's getting steeper and steeper and eventually gets shallower and shallower. That means initially it's getting easier and easier to produce, and eventually it's getting harder and harder to produce, which will give us a slope for the cost function that initially becomes shallower and shallower, but eventually steeper and steeper. It initially becomes shallower and shallower because it gets easier and easier to produce, so our costs are rising at a slower and slower rate, and eventually they rise at a faster and faster rate. So the shape of this cost function is going to be determined by the shape of the production function along the slice that happens on that ray from the origin. Along a ray where we increase labor and capital by the same proportion as we go up on that ray. Now what happens along that slice is related to a concept called the returns to scale. So returns to scale is about what happens to output when we increase both labor and capital by the same proportion. Increasing returns to scale, which I'll denote by IRS, means that when I increase labor by some factor t, and I increase capital by some factor t, the output that I'm going to get from my production function is going to be greater than t times what I had originally when I just used labor and capital at its original quantities. In other words, if I double my inputs, I'm going to more than double the output. It's getting easier and easier to produce. The slope along the slice is getting steeper and steeper, which means it's becoming less and less additional costly as we produce more output. Constant returns to scale means that if we take our original labor and capital and we multiply it by some factor t, what we get out of the production function is exactly equal to t times what we had originally. It's not getting easy and it's not getting harder. If we double the inputs, we exactly double the output. And decreasing returns to scale means that when we multiply our original bundle by t, what we get from the production function is less than t times what we had originally. If we double the inputs, we're less than doubling the output. It's getting harder and harder to produce, which means the costs are going to rise at a faster and faster rate. So we can see that at this inflection point, we switch from increasing returns to scale to decreasing returns to scale. And there'll be one point at which it's exactly constant returns to scale. So the shape of this cost function is determined by the shape of the production function along that ray from the origin, along that slice. Now, what did we actually do to figure out these least cost consumption bundles? Well, what we did was we tried to identify the minimum possible budget where the budget is the wage times the amount of labor we hire plus the rental rate times the amount of capital we hire. We're trying to choose a combination of labor and capital, an input bundle, that makes that budget as small as possible, subject to the constraint that we're trying to reach an isoquant, subject to the constraint that the x that we're trying to produce is what we're going to get when we use that amount of labor and capital. So what that problem says is we're trying to minimize the expenditure or the cost by choosing a bundle that allows us to reach that isoquant. Now if that problem looks familiar, it's because we've done exactly the same problem for consumers.
when we try to solve for the substitution effect, we said what we'd really like to do is figure out what's the least compensation necessary to get you to an indifference curve. In other words, what's the minimum budget P1 times X1 plus P2 times X2 choosing the consumption bundle X1, X2 such that we reach the indifference curve that has the label U, such that we reach the indifference curve U when we consume that consumption bundle. So we did exactly the same thing for consumers. And if you compare these two problems, the only difference is that we've changed notation. P1 has become W, P2 has become R. X1 has become L and X2 has become K. And the utility functions become the production function. But the problems are exactly identical. And so we would solve this problem in exactly the same way. We'd set up the Lagrange function. We'd solve the optimization problem. We'd get a function for labor and for capital that tells us what the least cost way is of producing different levels of output. And once we have those functions, we would just multiply them by the wage for labor, by the rental rate for capital, and sum those to get the cost function. So we can see how we can derive the cost function by knowing the production function. And we can tell by the shape of the production function whether we have increasing returns to scale or decreasing returns to scale. Now, once we've arrived at the cost function, the rest of the two-step profit maximization method is exactly the same as it was before. Once we have a cost function, we can simply take the marginal cost by taking the, the derivative with respect to x. That will give us the slope of this cost function. Once we have the marginal cost curve, we know that we're going to produce where price is equal to marginal cost as long as price is at or above the break-even price. So everything from here on is exactly the same as before. The only complication that arose when we had two inputs was that we had many different ways of producing a particular output level, and we had to figure out what's the least cost way of producing that output level. In the short run model, we can only vary labor, so there really was only one way to produce any given output level, and that was to hire enough labor to get there. Now we have lots of different ways which makes it slightly more complicated to calculate this cost function.